what you do is a product which people are afraid to do, uh, they can't do, or they think you can't do it. All right, we'll start now. Okay. Episode six, it's called The Deal Ranch Podcast. David Stratinger, thank you so much for coming on. So your background, rather unique. You're a developer. You've developed thousands and thousands of homes, condos, oceanfront property. And from what I've read, it looks like you've developed five different golf courses or more as well. So really just want to interview you today and learn how you got started. Um, where I think you started from Virginia, how you got to Myrtle Beach what you did with the city here, and then talk about a couple different deals you did. Yeah, I think just real quick, uh, yeah. my family is from South Dakota. Wow. They were German immigrants uh, in the cattle ranching business, and my f family still is. My cousins have my great-grandfather's really? ranch, and it's a pretty sizable operation. Uh, my dad uh, grew up in that in the early 1900s, and um, Long story short, went to college, he was in World War II, and then graduate school, and he ultimately ended up with the uh, Atomic Energy Commission. Um, and we uh, ended up working at uh, headquarters in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, I did the normal things in high school and uh, was reasonably good at football and uh, enrolled at uh, Hamden Sydney College, which is a men's yep. college in Virginia. I wasn't good enough to play uh, a big university, but I was good enough to play Division Three. Cool. So we did that uh, for four years. I had a great experience there. Uh, got involved in student government, and I was involved with the uh, president of the student body and so forth and so on. So I developed a certain amount of activism wow. in my early life. Uh, I was going to go to law school and decided that was not really what I wanted to do. And um, my dad said, maybe you want to look into uh, the city planning, city management career. And uh, sure enough, I looked into it and the University of Virginia was offering uh, fellowships <laughs> Uh, for a master's degree, and I, I got that master's degree in, uh, at UVA in Charlottesville. Um, my first job uh, was with the uh, city of Char Charlottesville, which is the home yep. of UVA, uh, as an intern, and then I uh, got a uh, position with the city manager's and mayor's office in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, this is right out of grad school. Mm -hmm. um, was an assistant to the mayor, a uh, gentleman by the name of John Belk, who was chairman of uh, Belk wow. uh, Department Stores, who was a very uh, influential and major figure in the Southeast. Uh, and just developed a great relationship with him. And then I became an, uh, as it is assistant, and then I became an assistant city manager. Uh, got involved in a lot of development-related things. Mm -hmm. At that time, Charlotte was starting to yeah. really uh, take a preeminent position as a major southern trade center. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I was around... Uh, back then, you could just take a bulldozer, a city could <laughs> right. level a block, and then yeah. uh, put something new up. Uh, it's not quite that easy today. But anyway, I had some exposure to that. and. But uh, my, I was 28 years old, and I'd been there about, what, five, four or five years. And uh, I was interested in becoming a city manager uh, and having my own city, which is sort of the progression for mm -hmm. assistant city managers. And uh, John Belk uh, was playing golf with the mayor here in Myrtle Beach. Oh, wow. John had a home here in Myrtle Beach. And... Uh, I don't know, conversation came up. He said, 
the mayor here said, we're looking for, his name is Bob Hirsch, mm -hmm. said, we're looking for a city manager. And John Belk said, I got a, he's young, but I think he can do the job. And long story short, uh, I was hired by the city council. Wow. Uh, it's kind of interesting because there's a lot of political rancor back then. It was more than Republican versus Democrat, but it was old school sure. versus uh, northern new timers. <laughs> exactly. Um, it was it was a really uh, great experience for me yeah. to be able to you know stay uh, in the game without getting uh, knocked over. By, <laughs> That's exactly by, right. by the game. Yeah. Uh, and I did that. Uh, I think that what really intrigued me is that I. A friend of mine uh, built, who became a friend, built uh, our house uh, in the Dunes Club, and I got enamored with that whole building process. Yeah. Uh, and after uh, what four and a half years as city manager, uh, I sort of recognized that perhaps yeah. my lifetime calling. Uh, was not in government, but mm. perhaps it was more in in uh, creating buildings. Mm. Uh, I used to build tree houses when I was a right, kid, right. and uh, that the building process, the architecture, the aesthetics, the process uh, fascinated me. Anyway, I was hired by the same guy that built my house for about a uh, we lasted about a year, year and a half, and. It was an interesting uh, experience. We were had projects in Hilton Head, Vero Beach, Sarasota, uh, and of course Myrtle Beach. And there was uh, uh, a lot of uh, time in airplanes and mm -hmm. pilots, and it was it was a high life. And he and I really could not agree on the future of the company, and it was his company. Right. And we we parted ways amiably. And I said, I'm going to start. What year was that? 1981. Okay. I founded Winchester and Land and Development. And I didn't have any money. Uh, I had a desire. I yeah. did have connections sure. with some of the people here in Myrtle Beach. And uh, the... First, uh, I'm going to say the first project that we envisioned was a total failure. Mm. Uh, it was in Merle's Inlet. Uh, it was a joint venture with uh, Chicora Development. Uh, yep. Had great views right on the marsh overlooking wow. the inlet itself. Two uh, five-story uh, buildings. And were we, they to be condos or yes, okay, condos, yeah, two and three bedrooms. It was a great plan. We set up a, a sales uh, operation there, but it just would not move. Wow, you, we couldn't get the pre sales. Wow, uh, so for all intent and purposes, you know, it was a, it was a failure, we just mm -hmm. uh, could not get uh, traction. And Chicor at that time was, you know. The yeah. foremost uh, real estate company, and they couldn't figure out why it wouldn't apply. Right. But you know, again, back in those days, you did have to, and even today, if sure. you're getting into some of this heavy construction, you need to know that you have buyers. <laughs> yeah. You so doing good feasibility studies, yeah. knowing your market. Right. Um, that's an an amazing background and intro to to get started here. So I wanted to ask one question that I think I missed earlier. What are the primary role of the city manager itself? And do you think being the city manager for a while gave you a good foundation for getting into real estate, whether it be relationships or learning zoning or maybe a city plan, understanding where the town's going to grow? Really, really all of the above, man. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, we, you know, you're around the planning uh, business as well as the mm. building permit business as well as the uh, construction side um, I could see it yep I think one of the reasons that I well, maybe one of the major reasons that I got into my own company is I did thought that the level of development in this community was really substandard. Mm -hmm. uh, the hottest thing back in the late 70s and early 80s 
was a, what they call stacker shacks, mm -hmm. modular boxes. Oh, wow. They put them on the ocean, the old Ocean Forest property. Yeah. And they were up there in the um, uh, Lake Arrowhead Road area. And it was all oceanfront. And it was, and it was affordable. Yeah. But it was, it was just, uh, and again, I'm not being critical of the individuals because they may be, a, you know, they were trying to meet a market. But yeah. it did not add anything to the future of Myrtle Beach wow. as far as uh, uh, oceanfront uh, development. Yeah. Um, and you're seeing more and more of that. And I said, look, I, I can do better than that. Sure. You know, again, I, I'm from South Dakota, but I, I, <laughs> I, you know, I've got, I felt like I had more of an eye right. in terms of architecture and aesthetics and so forth and so on than uh, was currently being presented by the uh, development community at the time. There were some good things, a right. couple of good things that were done, but there's a lot of ragtag um, yeah. type of development here in the ocean front that, mm -hmm. and off the ocean front that really did not add anything to the future of yeah. Myrtle Beach. I had Warren Smith on a couple couple weeks ago and he was talking about some of the the last good opportunities in town as far as beachfront stuff or maybe um, our areas to be redeveloped like stuff through Porcher like stuff that you may think back then could have been done but now I think people are bringing a lot more money down so there could be some ragtag stuff still Legacy here in town. There I think is. that will be redeveloped a lot here soon. Yeah, I would I would think sooner or later. Yeah. Or later. Um, as far as Myrtle Beach itself, before we get into your career, which I'm excited to talk about, but you talked about it there. We had these developers that weren't doing at least what you envisioned. What did you? Because me being newer to Myrtle Beach, last two three years, been down here, but meeting all these people that a lot of whom you know or have worked with, but. Folks that have been here 20, 30, 40 years, it's two different Myrtle Beaches right now, right? It used to be something much different than there's a lot of institutional money coming down, building communities, building towers. What did you see in Myrtle Beach that other people didn't see? Was it the location, geography? How did you think that it was going to be such a, you know, a place worth investing or building in? Well, again, the... the South Carolina has had a, historically had a difficult time mm -hmm. uh, since Reconstruction. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, right. it's, uh, it's not like there's a lot of corporate glue, General Motors, nope. uh, yeah. Kodak, AT&T, right, or right. whatever. Right. So you have a, effectively a, uh, I don't want to call it a poor state, but mm -hmm. there, there, kind of. this state didn't have the resources, with right. the possible exception of Greenville. Mm -hmm. And later on, Charleston, even though Charleston was uh, crippled for a long time. Yeah. Uh, so the, the one point I'm trying to make is that there was not that much uh, capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Either from a banking standpoint or from a, a buyer standpoint. Yeah. And as you know, uh, uh, resort development is totally discretionary yeah. nobody has to have it <laughs> right know? right it's right. all you know you buy it on whims whimsy and yeah. you buy it oh yeah we can uh, go down there yeah. we can bring the kids down there right. we can stay all summer you know yeah. so forth and so on but um that that was hampering myrtle beach that's mm -hmm. the old myrtle beach i yeah. mean it was considered to be kind of a a redneck resort yeah yeah uh and you know it still has some elements of that on the development side sure um uh, Again, it was uh, undercapitalized from the standpoint of both the people offering the product and the people buying the product. Mm, yeah, it's a good point. So diving into your career, so starting Winchester in 1981, what would, after breaking off with the company that you just got started with, what was your hypothesis? What did you want to start building? Was it only oceanfront condos? Was it just resort style? Real estate, like what, what did you want to set out on when you got started? Well, one thing I learned from the failure of that Merle's Inlet project, just because I liked it, uh, <laughs> it doesn't mean others do. Doesn't mean that's the market's going right, to want right. it. Uh, again, uh, the splendid views of the marsh and mm. the birds and the blue herons and the white right. egrets. Right. I mean, that was a, an obviously, in retrospect, a very esoteric <laughs> appreciation <laughs> right, on my right. part. Yeah, but. 
I, again, so much of development is happenstance and accidental, but mm -hmm. uh, in talking to some of you know, the local people, they say, look, get on the ocean front. You can't fail there. You yeah. know, everybody wants to be on the ocean sure. front. Maybe it's only a select group want to be on the marsh front mm -hmm. or the river or whatever. Right. So uh, we did develop a project called Carolina Winds with some local uh, couple of local investors and uh, it was a, a smashing success I mean wow uh, it was a literally the condo hotel had uh, I think 20 36 condominiums on the ocean front yeah. and then running down uh, perpendicularly we put 88 uh, uh, what we call shotgun suites mm. uh, and we were going to keep those but the success was so uh, well uh, received that we decided to sell those too. Yeah. Um, so that was 1983, 124 units. So that was your first big right, right. boom. Hey, we might have right. something here. I right. can do this. Right. Yeah. But up to that, I was, I can't say that I was considering getting back into city management. <laughs> <laughs> um, so once you finished that, you said earlier, you didn't start the business with much money. This deal goes through, and you sold everything off, you're saying. You planned on keeping some of the units, but you wound up selling all of them as condos? It varied because okay. um, we had, after we finished that 124-unit Carolina Winds, we yeah. went down and um, did a project called uh, the Savoy. It was an old cottage lot, and yeah. I, I had a... I am, so thankful for my affiliation with the guy by the name of Tom Pegram, who was an architect during that era. I think he may have designed 70 ocean fronts. Oh, wow. Some things, yeah. He was very, very capable. Wow. Um, but the, the, uh, uh, the, you know, that affiliation uh, spawned a number of things. That, Interesting. You know, can you, hey, what do you think of this, Tom? Can we yeah. put this? And he said, let me think about it. And he'd come back and wow. he'd come up with a schematic or whatever. And um, I was fortunate, I guess, the things, one of the things that helped me was having uh, relationships with some of the, the local players here, mm -hmm. call them the movers and shakers That's or whatever. Right. Yeah. And I think they trusted me. They knew I wasn't going to run away with the purse. Uh, so I did have some great relationships with some of the local yeah. uh, people. And, and did that help most from gaining gaining their trust to raise capital for a deal? Or, yeah. Or, okay. Yes. Because in a relationship way, obviously having those people yes. can and then, help speed up processes right, or right. get a zoning request through maybe. And then you could raise, you know, today you've got to bring about 35 percent of the money to the table yeah. let's say it's a hundred million you better bring 35 million. that's right back then you could bring five million. Oh wow i, I and i'm saying five right. figuratively but <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a lot less interesting um how did you evaluate although you said you can't go wrong with beach but like as a developer it's a little different for me <clears throat> looking at an apartment building or buying an apartment building seems easier to see because it's already there. You can tell if it's a good location. You can tell the building surrounding if it's a good area, what rents are, right. you know, what school districts it, it, it's in. How do you evaluate just this empty parcel and like visualize it? Like what to you are like criteria to saying, hey, we want to build on this lot. Like how do you visualize a deal or a build like that? Well, it seems hard back, to conceptualize. Back then, so much was instinct. Okay. Today, you have to have it. Uh, the banks are requiring it to be underwritten by a right. third party, mm -hmm. a appraiser, consultant, Robert Charles Lesser, yep, yep. John Burns, right. uh, the CBRE, a number of uh, third party people that underwrite deals, which is which is better because sure. um, back then we were just sort of using a lot of instincts. <laughs> right. Uh, one of which was you can't go wrong in the ocean front. <laughs> sure. Two was you go across Ocean Boulevard, mm, you know, you better be priced right. And right. The further you get away from the ocean, the more price sensitive it is. And exactly. And so forth and so on. When did you start to go away from oceanfront condos to, and, and do a different asset classes? You've built golf courses. Yeah. I guess this could be a segue of when did the business start growing and, and what interested you about changing to different projects? Well, one of the 
algorithms that I have in development, you have to be able to pivot mm. because most of the negative and positive things that happen to a developer right. are outside yeah. of your control. Yeah. And in my career, uh, we endured um, uh, high interest rates. Yep. They got to 18% at one time. Uh, tax reform during the Reagan administration. Yeah. And that, that dinged us pretty heavily, and I can come back over that. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, the, uh, of course, the more recent uh, 2008 um, uh, subprime mortgage business. Yeah. And then you have hurricanes and, you know. Dot-com bubble. Yeah, yeah dot-com yeah. bubbles. Yeah. A lot of things that, yeah. you know, just whimsically happen that mm. you have no control over. Right. So to be successful, and again, a lot of it's luck. They say. Uh, <laughs> That's what I hear. They say that um, real estate is all about location, location, location. Mm. I, I would argue with that. You, I would argue that it's location, timing, and luck. <laughs> Interesting. You need I to like have those, those three. three things. And the, and the third thing you can't do anything about. And timing is, is difficult too because there's just things that happen outside. It, it, you know, it could be competition. It could be uh, any number of things that you right. have no control over. We got out of the high-rise business the first time. We were in it in two phases because of tax reform. We mm. had these buildings 75% pre-sold right. and we couldn't sell the rest of them. Wow. So would you, because you pivot Because it there? wasn't tax advantageous right. like it was for the first group. And wow. you know, we tried to close everybody and uh, that's another story too. But uh, it's uh, just stuff that happens out there that sure. you can't control. So uh, we essentially, uh, you know, just uh, tried to stabilize the, mm -hmm. we had, I think, three or four high rises at that time and tried to, you know, get, get rid of the product and, and uh, finish right. selling it out. And then we moved on to um, golf courses. Yeah. And How I'm did not, that come to be? I'm not a golfer. <laughs> I had a, a friend and then a, a ultimately a partner that knew a little bit more about golf than I did. And we built uh, a golf course down in uh, um, Merle's Inn called Blackmore. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had investors, some of the same people that sort of followed me around. And that market got overbuilt. Yeah. I think we were the 87th golf course. And by the time we were finished with that golf course, it was like 110 wow. courses. And it just, you know, it's just a copycat market. Yeah. And that is the Myrtle Beach market. That's it, right. I can come back to that. That's what I call the, you know, the, whether it's a, a water slide or miniature golf course, a, a um, entertainment theater, a high rise, or a um, um, golf course. Golf course. Yeah. Uh, you just have competition very rapidly. Yeah. And you you got to be able to get in and get out. Back recording, we're good. Um, so we're talking about getting in and getting out of the golf course, as you were saying. I oh. think you were growing growing up in yeah, Virginia, the Washington uh, area where I grew up. We never had the money to uh, be in a country club, and there was a few kind yeah. of marginal municipal courses. And I'm talking Maryland, Virginia, you know, the, yeah. the D.C. Yeah. area is big. Yeah. And I said, well, you know, this is just a great place for the daily fee Myrtle Beach concept. Yeah. And uh, the difficulty is finding, you know, land. Obviously, you need, you know, a couple hundred acres to mm -hmm. do uh, uh, just the golf course. So anyway, we were able to uh, spend a lot of time with a dairy farmer on the edge of wow. um, D.C. and Loudoun County and developed a uh, golf course called uh, Raspberry Falls. Yep. And it was very, very successful. And wow. we went on and did another one called uh, Old Hickory, also uh, very successful. Uh, and we ended up managing four other courses and building uh, another one for the, one of the power companies in uh, Pennsylvania. So again, well, I was just pivoting. Sure. And we were sort of, you know, moving to where the, the, uh, the, uh, 
the market the market was yeah. wow and then um sort of i guess about 93 94 uh i guess it was one of the administrations decided that you could deduct up to a million dollars in interest on any home, whether Whoa. whether it was single, yeah, your primary or secondary. Yep. And uh, that set that market back on fire, and we sure. went back into the the high rise business. Oh, but again, wow. totally, it, totally from the outside. Interesting. Yeah. To go back a second, so Raspberry Falls, it looks like 1996, and Old Hickory 2003. Were you also? Well, one, how, how do you get a golf course deal? Like you, you kind of mentioned that they're spent time with the dairy farmer, but knowing roughly the area you want to go into, how do you get that track of land? Is it kind of similar to buying any other piece of real estate where you're yeah. working with a broker or nurturing a relationship and wherever it matures is the track you get kind of thing? Yeah. Because it we, takes years yeah. to get that. It does. Camp, it yeah. does. It took a lot of time. Yeah. And then you get in those big metropolletan areas, you can, mm, you can lot of hands triple it, what it takes in, <laughs> here in the South. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it's all of the above. Mm -hmm. uh, we knew of this track of land, um, it was near, very near the Potomac River. Um, we knew a builder that wanted to come in and build oh, houses around it. And we sort of got together and uh, worked out a joint venture arrangement where we we did the course and they would do the housing around and it was a high-end oh, housing wow. community that's what i was going to ask i was curious if you guys had any play in the houses being built or if you guys even developed back then no okay no. um how hard is that to work with a builder because <clears throat> you come you almost have two different not two different religions but you have two different goals right you're building the golf course but you also have to lay out the golf course the whole layout with Air, optimal areas to build homes in between right. and viewing the course. So is it tough working with that builder in that process or? Not what? really. Yeah. Uh, at that time we were using the Gary Player design yeah. people. We used wow. them down here and up there. Yep. And they knew what we needed. Uh, yeah. In some cases, you know, you want uh, housing yield and others, uh, the terrain and everything else said, you know, just forget it, let's put the course you yeah. know, in this area, you try to, you try to maximize it, obviously. Got it. But you can, you can over maximize it, um, <laughs> yeah. and it, it, it takes away from the golf experience. Exactly. Exactly. So, 1994, to get us back on track, um, you're talking about the up, deduct up to a million dollars in interest. So, how did that pivot? So, you get back into oceanfront properties mm -hmm. at that point again. Mm -hmm. What projects were? That time frame, Sea Watch Ooh. Plantation. Well, interestingly enough, we went in on one, two, maybe three uh, tracks of land that were uh, abandoned or otherwise unsuccessful for the previous developer that got washed away during the tax reform. Wow. Um, and um, I, one of them was uh, Ocean Reef. Uh, the other one was, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think of it, uh, or anyway, there are two others uh, that we just went in, just picked the bones. Really? Uh, of, um, what was there, Beach Colony was the second Got one. It. Third one was up there in North Myrtle Beach. We just picked the bones of uh, a track that could be developed. Interesting. And added, I don't know, maybe 80, 100 units. And yep. part, it was either part of a hotel or a previously unsuccessful condo hotel, which was still yep. operating. Wow. Well, interesting. As that moved on, you, <clears throat> you're in a plethora of different assets now, right? The built to rent communities, if you're local to Myrtle Beach, at least, Market Commons, and then St. James, very unique. And I think. Some of these neighborhoods or areas have redefined Myrtle Beach, right? Especially for the younger people moving to town. These are the places people are moving. How do you pivot again from doing oceanfront condos to these communities now and redeveloping an Air Force base? I think it was like, yeah. when did that go on? Um, it's kind of an interesting story. When I was city manager, um, we annexed the Air Force Base. Right. Yeah, I heard about that. Uh, it was a kind of a sleight of hand move, but a very legal <laughs> in what we did. The United States government can't vote yep. whether you bring them in or not. So wow. 
I had no idea what was going to happen out there, but it turns out yeah. um, what would have been 20 years later, uh, we had the opportunity to go in with um, the McCaffrey people Got it. Who, who did the Central Commercial Corps Interesting. to do all the uh, housing around. Then we built about seven or 800 houses in there. Wow. I had a partner who was my city planner, a guy oh. by the name of Sam Burns, who's deceased now. But uh, we were very much into that Charleston type of architecture. Yep. Yep. Something I thought this area ought to have. 100%. Uh, and uh, just decided to create uh, a community out there. Mm -hmm. And um, that we were doing that while we were doing Oceanfront. And, oh, wow. And we were doing St. James and uh, Seaside. Interesting. So we had sort of two... The high rise is all mine, but yeah. uh, Sam and I owned the uh, stick built operation for Got it. those other projects. Over the time, <clears throat> you started out with a hypothesis of. Like, and let me let me interrupt you. Yeah, please. Because we learned so much out of that market common experience. Yeah. We started looking at these small houses. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is what we're doing now, the build to rent. Yeah. Come, you know, coming up with, you raise the ceiling mm -hmm. uh, or have it, whether it's vaulted or trade. Right. You can create a sense of uh, volume that most people can't imagine yeah. unless they, they see it. 100%. So that, that experience of dealing with smaller houses and yeah. trying to minimize uh, the size of things, but to maximize the experience yeah. in a resort community was, was a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of fun for us. So is that what spurred the idea, is doing that? Because you see on the, <clears throat> on the backside of St. James, those tiny homes or cottage homes, and then also in Market Commons. Were those the communities that led the idea for these larger built-to-rent communities you guys are doing now? <sighs> to a degree. Yeah. To a degree. Um, the, uh, we just happen again, I can say it's so happenstance. One of my partners, uh, was up in New York, David Wilkes and, uh, stumbled across a community where really cute little cottages. And right. he said, what are you selling them for? And he says, well, I'm renting them. And anyway, we got with another partner of ours, Joe Morrison, who's very good with numbers yep. and a contractor. Yeah. And we said, can you, can you make this work? Does, does this work? Can we get rents that will support that kind of, uh, yeah. that kind of a development, that kind of look, that kind of a community? And um, I, at first I had doubts, but then we found that hmm, we were on the front end of something. 100%. Yeah. And again, location, timing, and luck. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, now you're starting to see kind of when you talked about the, the water slides or golf courses, except across the country, people are copycatting that model to build to, to rent communities. People, right. as opposed to wanting to rent just maybe an apartment building, right. they want the individuality. They still want to have a home. They still want space. Maybe they don't want people above them, which is what you guys are providing right. in these communities. Right. And right. still be able to walk around and mm -hmm. have a um, little downtown, or not downtown area, but um, a, yeah. a common area as well. It's a fascinating product. Um, what I'm really excited to talk about, and I think I had one more question for you about um, development overall. Did your interest change along the way? So early on, you just were fascinated by project to project. Did, did anything change along the way of what you got out of bed for every day? I mean, you're building thousands of oceanfront condos. You're building hundreds of homes. You're developing golf courses. Like, what got you out of bed every day? Was it building a profitable development? Was it satisfying your partners? Was it scratching the itch of creativity and building something unique like what what was it for you as time went on probably all of the above yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, a, and another element you didn't mention and that's called feeding your family mm -hmm. <laughs> an important one that's right say. yeah yeah because it's a hard business of all of the real estate businesses it seems like the development business is the one that maybe it can pay off the most but it is certainly certainly seems like one of the ones that has the most amount of risk, right? Because these developments oh, are taking yeah. five years, yeah. 10 years, three years, it's all these economic cycles. It is, it is not for sissies. <laughs> you know, you have to have a passion. A stomach for it, too. And again, if you have a family, I had yeah. three kids and a wife and, you know, uh, and a 
pretty hefty mortgage. Yeah. You know, I, I Makes stayed, you get out of bed. Made me get out of bed. But when I got out of bed, I was happy doing it. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, I, I look forward to uh, every day. And yes, there were, you know, all kinds of we, problems. But we used to say there's no such things as problems. There's only creative opportunities. That's so, the truth. Yeah. And you have to address it that way. Yeah. Because uh, what is it? Uh, I tell my son, who's turning into a developer, is what you do is a product which people are afraid to do, uh, they can't do, or they think you can't do. It. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And it takes you know it takes courage and passion. Yeah. Passion's got to drive that courage. Absolutely. That you you think it's going to. Um, uh, come to fruition. I mean, yeah. it's even know, in you, the hard times. Yeah. Yeah. Even in the even good the times, good times, yeah. uh, you know, it's, uh, you have to look at it as, as if, it, you know, there's no, nothing's impossible. Mm. Yeah. It, you think things are impossible, you probably ought to consider another job. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think in light of that, I would love to talk about the North Beach Tower. So on every podcast episode, it's called the deal ranch. I like to focus on one deal and that could be for better or worse, whatever sure. the deal someone's done. But I've heard about this uh, project from quite a few people. I've read a good bit about it. Um, it sounds like you found a pretty creative solution to, you know, a, a massive property and really pro arguably the most iconic property in the county. So North Beach Tower, similar to Atlantis, 337 units. You broke ground in 2006, finished in 2009. So anyone looking at a calendar can tell that that property was developed right. through 2008. Right. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are different challenges along the way with that. So I'd love to hear the story from beginning to end if you're open to, to kind of sharing it. Yeah, I think, to put it in some kind of setting, we were rolling yeah. off an incredibly, uh, uh, at that time, seven, 10 year uh, uh, wave. Like a hot street? Demand oh, okay. for oceanfront condominiums. Got it. Um, and it was getting to the point where, and then you you probably ought to put this on your, uh, over your headboard at night, but when it gets too good to uh, be true, it probably it is. is. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we were selling, uh, for example, in um, um, Island Vista. Mm which was a project uh, just before North Beach Towers, we had people buying those units, and they're great units. Yeah. It's a great building, great location, and I'm very proud of the architecture. But they were buying them, and people were buying them and flipping them and making $200,000. Holy cow. And this is back in 2006, seven ish uh, Five. Oh, okay. Five or six. Whoa. So, you know, I was a local hero. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, but what we did is there was a campground up in North Myrtle Beach. Uh, another guy and I who does single family, uh, did single family at the time, we bought that uh, entire campground for mm. $56 million. Wow. And again, that's back when the banks were just saying, you know, How much did you put somewhere. down on that then? Like to buy, like how was that loan structured? Well, again, we had to clear the campers out, <laughs> okay. you know, uh, and I, I, Matt, I can't really recall, but I know it was heavily leveraged because mm. uh, it appraised more than That's right. what we paid for. Yeah. Anyway, so I took off the uh, oceanfront side mm -hmm. for the towers and he took off the, the upside for yeah. um, the single families Got it. and he was... You know, he'd been doing stick built, and I've been doing high rises, and it seemed to fit pretty well. And we tied it together with a restaurant and spa and um, yeah. a lot of pools and amenities. So, um, anyway, we uh, conceived effectively two towers yep. that, and we uh, connected them by that iconic bridge yeah where did the before you dive in too far for anyone that hasn't seen it i would i would encourage you to look it up <clears throat> excuse me but how did you conceive the idea for that because it is completely different than any other property we have on the ocean front like where was your inspiration obviously besides atlantis but but what made you want to do it ultimately build that that property 
Well, again, we were on the market wave was yeah. substantial. Yeah. And if we figure we can sell 151, we can sell 300 and what was it? 337. Yep. And the idea was we had enough room to put two buildings. Again, mm -hmm. the site dictated yep. what, what we you had to do. Okay. And the architect, again, Tom Pegram, was very creative at uh, fitting fitting things in. And I thought, for example, we'd have to do one tower, mm. sell it, finish it, and then do the other tower because oh, wow. I didn't see the the market being uh, deep enough on a pre-sale basis for right. us to you know, proceed through two towers. Mm. Well, we actually went ahead and did put uh, one of the towers on the market. And again, these are all pre-sales. Yeah. We, we did a great job of, of, uh, of uh, schematics, architecture, yeah. uh, had a lot of uh, backup as far as graphics. I mean, it, it was, it was well, well conceived and well done by the people that handled it for us. So we ended up selling one tower. And we wow. said, well, you know, <laughs> why don't we put the other tower on the market, <laughs> sure, you know? Sure. And uh, I found that uh, we couldn't just rely on one real estate company. Uh, we had to bring in, and we ultimately had three in there. Interesting. We said, what okay, year was this that you put the second one on the market? Two, two five, two six, two okay. five. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it, it happened boom, boom. It wasn't, uh, you know. Interesting. Yeah. So um, we knew we had to have the pre-sales because it, the project is a three hundred and twenty million dollar yeah. adventure. I mean, it was yeah. it was huge, and I wasn't under any illusions about you know, you know what we were carrying. So I was you know we were going to have an eighty percent pre-sale, or, or we were going to have to you know, yep. sell the land to somebody else and let them do it. Mm -hmm. um, so. The, other, the three real estate companies, we just had them competing against each other. Said, wow. you got 50 today, you got 50 today, you got 50 today. And you sell yours, you can have more. You don't sell yours, you don't get any more. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, we had them in a horse race. Wow. Um, and ultimately ended up with, gee whiz, it was like 80 plus percent pre-sales, which was uncommon. Uh, to get to that level. Um, that seems like a ton. 80% of the, the 330 and nothing's built yet? Or this is kind of partial? Pre it's all pre-sale. They, they put down 10% uh, 10, 10 uh, deposit, which they couldn't uh, walk away from. If they, mm -hmm. if they walked away from the deal, we kept the money. Yeah. And I think we had about $30 million in... Uh, deposits okay and that was used as equity exactly in the deal with our bank loan and also yeah. had to i needed more i had to bring in uh, uh lehman brothers which was an interesting really adventure yeah huh. um so uh we ended up uh getting those pre-sales with uh 10% equity and then what we call a mezzanine loan mm -hmm. that uh, Lehman Brothers provided. So a short term, like a bridge loan or different? Uh, yeah, okay. it's a bridge loan, yep. yeah. And they'd be, they would be first out when yep. we close the units out and then we'd be behind, I'd be behind that. And I was on it um, by myself. I mean, it Whew. yeah. So what was the loan? You're saying it was 350 or that was before the, the down payments? Uh, I don't recall. I really don't, Matt. Well, what was the uh, it was so the huge. bridge? The it bridge loan was interest only for that period, or or no payments at all until the mezzanine loan. Yeah, the mezzanine loan. Yeah, it was equity, and it would be paid back uh, as first out. Yep. And uh, it's effectively a bridge. Yeah. You know? Okay. And it was uh, a super rate of interest. Wow. So interesting. But the numbers still worked. I mean, okay. It was. I want to say there was a. Forty or fifty million dollar profit, pre-tax. Wow! So um, it was still attractive. So then, how did the deal? Where do we go next? So this is two thousand five or six ish. The pre-sales are done. You have the mezzanine loan lined up. When do you start to realize, based on market factors of 
hey, we may be like, what was going on in the market at this time as we get closer to 2008? And then how did that start to affect your project during the build phase? Because it wasn't done till 2009. So kind of what happened step by step if you... Well, again, we had this uh, amazing pre-sale. Uh, we had a mezzanine lender. I had eight banks led by oh Bank goodness. of America. Uh, the loan was 200 and, I don't know, 30, 50, something like that. Um, and it was, you know, six of the largest banks in the country. Bank of America uh, sort of took the lead in the thing. They, they wanted... You know, Interesting. They, they were uh, very, very supportive wow. of what we were doing. Um, and... Um, We, you know, it, it was, believe me, it was unbelievably difficult to put together because mm -hmm. you had Lehman Brothers, so six banks, and then you had all sorts of um, cross easements between the usage. For oh, example, the people up the hill and the single family had to have access to the swimming pool. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and we made, we built 13 pools. So okay. Yeah. It wasn't uh, particularly uh, unfair, but... Uh, there was just a lot of back and forth uh, uh, relationships that had to be established. Yeah. And we had to put parking in for um, the towers as well as future parking for what was, con it hasn't been built, uh, a, a third phase of that thing. So, oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So after all of the the financial portion is set up. So we have all these banks, which I'm sure took an exceptional amount of time to do. When did the market start to affect the build phase and how did that affect? Yeah. yeah, so how did it progress? Yeah. Well, as we started building, we thought we'd be, you know, continue selling. Yeah, exactly. Like 20%. That's right. And mysteriously, things started to, you know, just slow down. We weren't getting mm -hmm. any new contracts. Yeah. I mean, it was quiet. Right. Very, very quiet. And we knew that uh, things were, uh, we weren't, we thought it would be a short term okay. situation. It turned out to be much greater. Uh, we, uh, what we did is we focused and, and we had a great relationship with the banks as I met with them at least every month to go over, you know, where we were, yep. what we thought. But we, what we did is uh, I said, okay, I've got what 280 buyers out there who's mm -hmm. got average of $90,000. Yeah. We're going to make sure they close. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if they close, we're out of the woods. That's right. That, that was the important thing. Yep. So we schmoozed those buyers. We sent them Christmas presents. We mm. sent them, uh, I think everybody got a pound cake one Christmas. <laughs> uh, we invited them down for a um, uh, presentation as the building was maybe about three quarters uh, completed wow. and spent $120,000 just in putting them up in hotels and uh, feeding them as a group. Wow. Um, and really wind and dined them and you know let them know that this is a substantial project and that, yeah you know things may be going to hell out there in the streets but this but you're buying this this yeah. thing's going to be built and it's just like you thought it was going to be so and and just for anyone listening the average cost of those units because they're luxury condos what were they pre-sale for like starting at 300 minimum all the way up to a million plus yeah, that's about right yeah. that's what i read yeah. okay yeah, it's a lot of variations ones twos threes and fours and five fives. bedroom units yeah. yeah that's crazy yeah um okay so keep going through during this downturn all the madness is happening really in the world but the economy especially and you guys are you know, you're you're doubling down essentially, spending more money to bring these people down. Did so you, then these start yeah. closing. So right. as that's happening, do because you, you're on, sitting by yourself on a 250, right. 80 million dollar okay. loan, right. while the world's melting down. I'm right. sure that's a right. it's a pit in your stomach. When they start coming down and you start to see it pay paying off, how does that affect the build? Like, when do you start to realize, okay, hey, we we might be able to make it out of this one? Still handsomely, well, or 
We... What happened when we got our CO, Certificate of Occupancy, mm -hmm. yep. on the building, ready to close, the mortgage market went to hell. Mm -hmm. There was literally no mortgage money for anybody on the ocean front. Right, right. So what that did is it started to drive down values everywhere. Exactly. And uh, we uh, had the units appraised. Mm -hmm. And oh, shit. Yeah. they came in, I don't know, maybe 12, 20% less than what these people paid for. Uh, and then, I mean, it, it was just a total evapor evaporation of any mortgage money. Yeah. And you know, you have some cash buyers, Sure. but the cash buyers aren't s asking the same question, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, that the, <laughs> the mortgage, but you, you couldn't even get a mortgage yeah. on the ocean front. So what we did is, um, try to come up with a scheme with working with the banks that once this, I think it lasted about three or four months. I had an empty building for three or four months. After like ribbon cutting? After it's over? After it was over, yeah. Oh my goodness. Because the mortgage market wasn't there. Uh, and then one of the mortgage companies started to surface, but by the time that they did surface and offer loans, the valuation had gone down, I want to say 30%. Oh my God. So if you spent a million dollars on a unit, it was worth $700,000, you know, and you can imagine that. And we're sitting there holding on to their cash. Yep. And for obvious reasons. Yep. And they don't want to close. So what we did, we got with the banks and we said, uh, this is probably, you know, could be one of the worst things that ever happened to anybody, but, uh, let's do this. Um, Let's just uh, do, let's make a deal. You can't afford that five bedroom. Yeah. Okay. How about we put you in a four bedroom and you know, we'll, we'll uh, keep your deposit obviously. And uh, mm -hmm. let's, let's run with the four bedroom at the discounted value. Oh, wow. Okay. That we had to do with the discounted yeah. value because yeah. you know, they couldn't get approved for yeah. anything else. We had some pressure from one of the banks that said, just close the first 15 or 20% cash and then let the chips fall where it may for everybody else. And I said, I don't have the stomach for that. That's <laughs> true. So, that uh, would have been a tumultuous yeah, spot I said, to be in. I said, I, can't, I don't have the stomach for that. That's just not fair to those 20 people that come in with cash. Yeah, no kidding. And even then, you know, it was no secret that valuations were just plummeting. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that starts to work. So you, yeah. you move people from the five kind of almost downshift them yeah. A, a, yeah. a bedroom and a bath. Right. Right. How does that impact where you're at with the deal? You're seeing progress. Hey, yeah. Pe okay. We're closing. We, we were moving them. Yep. And I had yep. a very creative, uh, uh, partner, uh, Bob Edelman who, uh, handled all the sales and you know, he would, sit down and let, let's, let's make this work. Let's make a deal. Yeah. Um, and we can't afford to throw, we only let them go down one level. They can go from a five to <laughs> okay. four or five, yep. you know, they yep. couldn't go down and drop down to, two <laughs> to a one. one. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the banks won't let us do that. You know, That's that right. kind of thing. Yep. Yep. But we did, um, we were selling, uh, again, I can't recall how many we closed, but we did close, uh, I don't know, maybe it's 40, 50% of them. And then we just had a fight for the other 50%. Okay. And that, uh, was, uh, we were selling about 50 a year, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it took us, we weren't out of there until 2012, I think. I mean, it was yeah. three or four years and, um, the banks were, I mean, again, I, we were very open with the banks. Mm. Uh, just, I think they, they could have brought somebody else in, which is typical for construction lenders that the first developer fails, yeah. you bring in a parachute guy that does this kind of thing, but they could see, we knew what we were doing and we had our, Got it. our, uh, a handle on the market. But we, uh, 
were able to just kind of grind it down and we had maybe, I don't know, let's say 50 or 75 units and we suggested to the uh, bank this, that, that we go ahead and uh, furnish them and run it in a hotel, condo oh. hotel. I said, we can break out of this thing. Wow. I, I was going to lose money, but uh, at least the banks could, you know, get paid off. Yeah. They didn't like it. There was so much pressure on, again, those big banks. 100%. To uh, you know, get the hell away from you know whatever they had holding. Right. So they, um, I got, I'm sure I'm leaving a lot out, but they okay. they basically uh, one of our meetings says, look, we, we we've got the uh, the feds and the control of the concern concerncy wants us to dump what's left of this loan. I think it was about a hundred million at yeah. that time, and uh, they said we need you to go out said to me, you, we need you to go out and find a buyer for our note. Wow. And uh, he said, and we'll, and we'll let you off the, uh, the note. So is this Starwood or South Street that buys it? From and, what I read? Well, that, they were the second guys in the note. Oh. There was another group that came in, um, and they were um, going to buy it, and everything was uh, okey-dory, and that, that fell through. I, they just uh, I'm trying to. I can't think of the name of them, but mm -hmm. anyway, uh, they found some excuse not to close. Sure. Um, and then South Street came in with. And they were backed by um, uh, Barry Sternlich's group. Um, Starwood. Capital. Starwood. Yeah. Uh, and they bought the note. Mm -hmm. And then, do you know what the discount was that they bought it for? Uh, I don't know. Yeah. But I'm. I suspect it was about 50%. Holy cow. Yeah. So when they buy that, they're not, are they also buying the property and buying everyone out? They're buying the debt from they're, no, the they're big buying banks. The, they're buying the remaining units. Well, basically, they're, yeah. okay. they're buying the debt, uh, you know, collateralized yeah. by the remaining units. And there was a way to get out. I mean, yeah. they, they could make some money again because like they were looking at, uh, I, I don't know this, yep. but I suspect it was 50 cents on the dollar. Holy cow. And again, it was all supported by the banks. Um, and uh, That's insane. Southwood uh, liked what we were doing, so they were paying us a fee, pretty good fee, uh, as was the banks up to that time, just to try to you know cradle this thing down and continue the, the sales program. That's what I read. So I read that your team stayed in place even after they acquired the debt. Yeah. yeah. And was that a part of the negotiation for you getting out, or did what did you see the purpose in doing that was to help them still move the units? Was that keeping the sales process in play? Yeah. Or in yeah. And, place? It, and quite frankly, there wasn't a lot of uh, alternatives out there. As far as <laughs> right. The, you weren't going to go do another high rise. That's a good point. At that point, golf courses got overbuilt. Yeah. And, um, like I say, you got to pivot or, you know, stay where you are. So yeah. it made sense for us to uh, stay there with it and they made it worth our while. So all things considered, started breaking ground 2006, get out of the deal altogether, it sounds like in 2012, and then you still stayed on. I'm sure your stomach was in a pit for a, a good couple of years or months or process there, but how did it end at the end of the day? Were you guys able to still make money or was it like, hey, we broke even and we were happy with how it turned out? Me personally? Out? Yeah. I lost five million. That's it. Yeah. Uh, Fortunately, I'd, I'd made five million before that. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, that helps. It that? was, you know, it was a loss, and of course, the way the tax code reads, you can yeah. carry that carry forward, forward for additional uh, uh, income in future years. But uh, uh, and again, we had a lot of fees that sort yeah. of counterbalance that stuff. Again, the big thing is, you know, being able to take a paycheck home to mama. Yeah. And feed the three children. That's I mean, right. That, that's that was my primary concern at that point. Wow. Was that? Did you see like, hey, if things go a certain way, that's going to be a challenge to do during that process or during those years where you're like, oh shit, like we got to figure this out or else things could get really tight at home. Was it like a very difficult position to stare down as the market started to take a dive like that? Well, sure it was. I mean, you know, yeah. say it's not for sissies. <laughs> that's right. It's, it's not for sissies. Um, 
Uh, again, that five million didn't clean me out totally, but it was yeah. a, it was a good dig. A dent. Yeah, it was a good dig. Fortunately, I'd had enough income on the previous projects that would have you know, wow, still kept us in some kind of survival mode. But uh, it's a crazy story. Yeah. I know we're we're coming close on time here, so I want to wrap up with just a couple other things so we can get you get you out of here for your meeting. Um, I would love to do another one of these because this has been awesome, and I know you got a bunch of other stories. But for right now, what is next? What are you focusing on right now? Um, the builder rent. Okay. We're, we have six projects. Yeah. We're moving out of Myrtle Beach because it's too crowded. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. the, the water slide syndrome, everybody's yeah. going to do it. Yeah. Uh, we're in Wilmington, we're in uh, uh, Bluffton, and mm -hmm. we're getting ready to go to Gainesville, Florida, and looking for others. Is the, do you have one in Savannah already? I know. Uh, That's Bluffton. Oh, okay. That's yeah. right. We're looking in Savannah. Yeah. So if you know anybody. Right <laughs> exactly. Maybe I do. Um, that's an awesome model. What, you touched on it a little bit there, but it would be cool to hear your perspective. Our county has experienced tremendous growth in the last mm -hmm. two, three years. Mm -hmm. What do you see the future of Myrtle Beach or Horry County um, as far as real estate? I mean, we have so much residential now. We have all of these right. homes. Maybe we're lagging in the, the commercial development and... Obviously, we're heavy on retirees, and I think we still need a, a bigger pull to bring younger people, which I think your product that you guys are building does do that, and Market Commons, another product that you built. But what do you see the future of real estate for Myrtle Beach? Because we have a ton of supply right now. Well, I, like you said, we have a, you know, many, many outsiders coming in. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been here 45 years and yeah. never seen anything like that. You have that. At the same time, you have a, a an economy that's, you know, ninety five percent based on tourism. Mm -hmm. If you take, yeah. you know, maybe take the hospital, the school exactly, out. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That that's it. I mean, it's it's totally. Uh, there's no corporate glue here. Yeah. Uh, like there is in some other communities. Uh, you also have a situation where a county, in this part of the world, was sort of separated from the rest of you know, the South yeah. by virtue of the swamps and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. It, it never really had any, uh, wherewithal, uh, to sub anticipate or support this kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, you had Burroughs and Chapin, uh, yep. and I'm not knocking them, but they never really did a master plan for right. 64,000 acres. Sure. The guys that, uh, came in the Woodside Brothers when they did the Ocean Forest Hotel. They had a master plan. Wow. Uh, but in the Depression, that got just trashed. Subsided, yeah. Um, so I, I... It's a tough market. The county has never yeah. had the sophistication, and, and I'm going to go ahead and say sophistication, to anticipate what's happening. Right. There's no infrastructure that we have. I mean, look at... You would look at the, we got one bridge across know, the right? waterway yeah. here between 501 and Highway 9. And that, it's a that, huge impingement. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they, nobody ever anticipated that or planned no. on it. Sure. Uh, you know, there's development plans and stuff when international papers sold the whole Carolina right. forest right. track. But there was no um, provision for how the hell are you going to get in and out of, you know, off the beach. Yeah. Uh, across the waterway. I mean, it's just, I, I have, I don't have, I don't, I don't know what we would develop with, uh, here. Yeah, it is tough. I would love to do another high rise, but, uh, it's very, very crowded. Um, uh, the population keeps coming in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, you know, I would like to think that, that, that there's, uh, I, I have a sense of optimism, but I don't. Mm. Uh, it's uh, you know it's an incredible beach you yeah. know it's an incredible resource yeah absolutely but you look at you know I hate that and I got a little bit of trouble with this when I was city manager but you look at Boca Raton uh, Naples uh, Hilton Head right. uh, some of the planned mm -hmm. uh, resorts they were they were ready for it got it uh we weren't and that's mm -hmm. when i when i one of the reasons i got out of city management is i could see that we were never going to be uh 
have either the will or the money to prepare for sure what was going to what I thought was going to happen and I wasn't any clairvoyant it's just that we had 60 miles of spectacular beach exactly. that there wasn't any else you know you go yeah. up and down the coast it's, it's it's rare yeah and for all intent and purposes it was uh, I don't want to say squandered that's too mm-hmm. uh, strong a word but it, it was not uh, handled the way we wouldn't handle it today got it yeah interesting uh, you look at, uh, you know, like just for example, like I said, you know, I wanted to get sort of the honky tonk out of Myrtle Beach, get yeah, the right. billboards down, get the overhead wires down, yeah. have a community appearance board, let's landscape this yeah. place, let's have some kind of sense of architectural review that gives us some sense of, of uh, place and community, purpose. Community, town, yeah. And it, I never could, uh, although I had a supportive city council, I didn't have a supportive community that and after I left and some of the council members that I served with left, it, you know, blinking signs, yeah. you know, blinking yeah. billboards. I read an article that you, you commented in, I think from like 1975, you said these blinking signs are like cancer. They, they, yeah. um, I don't know yeah. what the exact quote was. I read it yeah. earlier today. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's fascinating. Um, last question, and, and I want to wrap up, and I think you might have touched on it there, but is there anything you haven't built bought or developed project wise that you would like to do at one point that you have not done in your career today <laughs> you've done a lot yeah. so well I'm glad I don't have a shopping center <laughs> <laughs> and I'm glad I never developed an office building or a big box retail yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I, I you know I've enjoyed the um, the resort part I enjoyed the you know the residential side. Yeah. Um, and then and, and you know the golf courses were were very gratifying too. But I can't think of anything else that I would have rather done. You know. Yeah. I, I might have. You know, storage sounds like a <laughs> exactly right. a neat little niche right now. But yeah. it's not as sexy as what we do. That's for sure. Know. Yeah. Um, it's sort of utilitarian and yeah it's a cash flow monster it just yeah. build cash yeah. comes in yeah 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 i think you've done just quite all right well i appreciate you coming on david strategier okay. amazing career right. thanks for sharing the stories i think we can wrap up here okay awesome Great. thanks thanks for having me matt of course